All right, good morning, Lost Pines Cowboy Church. How's everybody doing today? Well, as you can see, the band uh, is not here. It was going to be Janice, and she told me that if I helped her out, she'd cook a meatloaf. So Joey will be eating meatloaf tonight. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, this first song we're going to do is called Rise. So if we could have everybody rise, please. I will rise out of these ashes, rise From the struggle I found in the rubble on the ground I will rise Yes, I will rise out of these ashes, rise From the struggle I found in the rubble on the ground I will rise Cause he who is in me is greater than I will ever be and I will rise yes he who is in me is greater than I will ever be and I will rise we got some doo doos here do 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 Sometimes my heart is on the ground And hope is nowhere to be found Love is a big man I once knew and yet I hold on to what I know is true That I will rise, and I will rise Out of these ashes rise From this trouble found in the rubble on the ground I will rise Yes, I will rise Out of these ashes rise from the struggle I found in the trouble on the ground I will rise Cause he who is in me Is greater than I will ever be and I will rise Yes he who is in me it's greater than I will ever be and I will rise Well, I keep on coming to this place That I don't know quite how to face So I lay down my life and hope to die Somehow I might rise. We're gonna sing this a little low now. I can rise out of these ashes, rise from the trouble I found in the rubble on the ground. I will rise. Sing it to the Lord. And I will rise out of these ashes, rise from the trouble I found in the rubble on the ground. I will rise. Cause he who is in me is greater than I will never be and I will rise. Yes, he who is in me is greater than I will never be and I will rise.
All right. Back a long time ago when we were at the saloon, I sang this song, so this is how old it is. But uh, I hadn't been a Christian for a long time, and I heard this song on the radio. Janice was saying, you know, you need to listen to this station. And I heard this song. It was the first song I heard. And uh, sorry. Uh, so anyway, when we sang at the church that day, I said, this is the first song I want to sing. And with that, just know if you're out there, I'm not going to preach, but if you're out there and you're having difficulties and things are happening to you, that you've been born again, all right? And that you will rise, all right. All right, Jerry. Well, today I found myself after searching all these years. And the man that I saw, he wasn't at all who I thought he'd be. I was lost when you found me here. And I was broken beyond repair. But you came along and you sang your song over me. And it feels like I'm born again And it feels like I'm living For the very first time For the very first time in my life Make a promise I'm a feeling in my soul And a prayer that I'm not wrong That the life I have now It is only the beginning Feels like I'm born again Feels like I'm born again It feels like I'm living For the very first time for the very first time, it feels like I'm breathing. Feels like I'm moving. For the very first time. For the very first time. For the very first time. Wasn't looking for. Something that was more than what I had yesterday. But then you gave to me, then you gave to me a life and a love that I've never known, that I've never felt before. Feels like I'm born again. Feels like I'm living. For the very first time, living for the first time, it feels like I'm breathing, feels like I'm born it feels again. like I'm moving, it feels like I'm moving, for the very first for time, the very first time. I'm living for the first time in, in my life. Welcome to Lost Pines Cowboy Church. If it's your first time, we're really glad uh, that you're here. We'd love it if you want to uh, fill out one of those uh, little cards that's there in, inside the program. My name is Prince, and uh, this past week, my wife, uh, Lita, and I celebrated our 54th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, 
That's where the applause goes. All right. And um, Friday night, our daughter and our son-in-law treated us to a Willie Nelson concert. It was uh, at an amphitheater down on Canyon Lake. We were there with about 5,000 other, uh, other, other people. But I'm telling you, when he got to the gospel songs, it was a spiritual experience. It absolutely was. This uh, coming Saturday, I will, uh, I will celebrate my 80th uh, birth, birthday, and I was really pleased a couple weeks ago to read an article that says that 90 is the new 60. So somewhere, you know, somewhere in there, I have, uh, I have been in ministry leadership since I was 17 years old, and, and so come next Friday, I'll mark 63 years of leading various types of ministries, and so the t-shirt of the day is just for fun. The t-shirt says, I'll quit when Willie quits. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm here at Lost Pines uh, Cowboy Church uh, on a one-year uh, contract uh, to be the pastor to uh, consult this church uh, toward a a new season in our life cycle, God willing, and the people uh, being uh, willing. Uh, some heard that, that I'm here to counsel, and that was not, that was not the right uh, word. I am trained in conflict resolution, but I'm really not a good counselor. If you need counseling, you don't want to come to me. <laughs> I'll tell you what marriage counseling looks like for me. A couple comes to me with some marriage I issues, and uh, I'll listen to one spouse for five minutes, and then I'll listen to the other spouse for five minutes, and then I'll say, both of you, stop being selfish. <laughs> Time's up. That's it. That, <laughs> that's my, that's my, my extent. So, um, so I'm, I'm also here to coach the team that will be seeking the person that God already has in mind uh, to be the next permanent pastor of the church. Pray like crazy about that. And turn in those uh, inserts that are in your, in your bulletin. Uh, my strong encouragement is you take them home and pray and uh, come up with some names that you can uh, uh, recommend and mail them in or you can always put them in the milk can or hand them uh, to me. So. I'm going to offer a prayer right now, and then um, uh, children will be dismissed then, and we'll, uh, we'll sing one more song. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we are here for the express purpose of giving you adoration, giving you praise, declaring your greatness. We thank you that you meet us here, but we also thank you that you meet us out there that uh, you're an ever-present help in time of trouble and that uh, you're always just walking beside us by, uh, by the Spirit of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. start the music Even in jail. 
from the homeless to the famous and in between. You formed us and you made us carefully till in the end we're all your children. So help me to And the wonder of your never-ending love Then all my life tell of who you are That you are wonderful and such a good father Then all my life tell of who you are So um, on, on February 2, a groundhog by the name of Puck, Punxsutawney Phil uh, came out of his hole in the ground to become the honored guest at a big festival in West Central Pennsylvania. And uh, Phil's responsibility each year on February 2 is to cast a shadow or not cast a shadow, which answers the question, when will winter weather ever come to an end? Well, Phil did see his shadow this year, and so that meant another month and a half of winter weather, and we have relatives that live in Pennsylvania, and they're asking, will winter ever end? And we're experiencing some chilly nights, aren't we? It's a question, isn't it? Parents of young children you have probably never counted. But the internet says that a child asks, on average, about 300 questions a day. Think of trying to answer those. Uh, so, so, so here's my counsel to parents. One of the best answers is, that's a great question. Could we talk about it tomorrow? So I tell people that I'm not getting old, but I am aging, uh, and with aging comes questions about health. Uh, so over the years, I've served uh, as a pastor or staff member of small town churches and big city uh, churches. As a church consultant, I've served churches with mostly white people, churches with mostly black people, churches with mostly brown people. I have served churches of every different 
uh, denomination you can imagine. Lita and I recently spent a year uh, consulting an Episcopal church. And when I left California to move back to Texas, I had to end a contract uh, consulting a four-square gospel church and a contract as a coach to a Lutheran pastor. But this is my first rodeo <laughs> at a cowboy church. I, I had never even attended a, a cowboy church before, and now I are the pastor of, of one. And when I was first invited uh, to teach here last uh, September, I called a, a pastor friend up in Bell County, and I said, what can you tell me about a cowboy church? And he said two things. Each cowboy church is as different as a thumbprint, and each one has an arena. And I asked, what is an arena? <laughs> um, Randy Ebling is our volunteer uh, staff member who manages our arena and leads our, uh, that ministry very intentionally. And I'm going to ask Randy uh, to come up and join me here right now. Right. So Randy, each, uh, each Sunday we have guests. And like me, we may even have some fairly long uh, people who've been attending for, for a while that, who may be a bit lacking in awareness on this aspect of Western heritage and, and culture. So um, I, have some, I have some questions. In leading Bible studies uh, over the years, uh, one of my mantras was, and, and often it was people who, who, had, who were just getting their Bible out of their Amazon package and uh, I always said in leading Bible studies that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Nevertheless, Randy, is an arena the same as a rodeo ground? Prince, I, I'm no expert on stupid questions, but that's probably as close as I've ever come <laughs> to why. <laughs> so we'll just let it start. Well, ta well taken. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Um, the, uh, actually, let me tell you, there yeah. is a difference. I hear at the arena, there's no shoots. There's no pens, and there's no cattle. There's no bull riding, there's no bronc riding, and there's no roping. I'm hearing less opportunities to get hurt. Well, no, no, we only have horses. Okay. I mean, we allowed mules and donkeys, too, but horses only. Okay, glad to, glad to, glad to know that. So I did attend our first arena day uh, two, two, two weeks ago, and uh, I was just here as a, a spectator. So for, for those who don't know, just uh, quickly, what happens at an arena day? Well, um, pretty much anything you want to do with your horses, because I'm, oh, it's not turned off. There you go. How about that? Is that better? Ah. Do I need to start over? Did you hear my joke? No. <laughs> no. Uh, so, you know, what, we, what I want to do with horses and, and uh, out here, and what we try to do is to give you an opportunity to practice with your horses. Most of us don't have arenas at our homes. We have pastures and pens and things like that, but we don't have an arena. Here, this church has an arena, so come out and practice whatever your horse needs. And if you want to teach your horse something new, I can probably help teach you how to teach your horse, okay? We also have a round pen. You work a horse in a round pen. You do everything on the ground before you ever get in the saddle, if you want to continue to live, that is, uh, because they can, uh, they'll kill you. They can Yes. So uh, yeah. we do the round pin. I've got an obstacle course out here. We've got 20 different obstacles. If your horse uh, needs to have some courage and overcoming fear, we'll help you do that. We've got some trails out there in the woods. We can do that. So um, we're here to help have fun and to build relationships together. Amen. That's All what right. we do. Amen. You told me that you lead this ministry intentionally. And in a brief conversation, you were, you were explaining to me that, that, you, that you have learned to teach spiritual truth <laughs> As at the same time that uh, you're, 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 you're teaching about horses and you're teaching horsemanship to people. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Um, there are four basic uh, principles to training a horse. In fact, these principles, as, as Prince alluded, I told him about that, these are the biblical principles, the spiritual principles. In fact, they apply not just to horses. I've never tried it, but I know people who have said they can train a white-tailed deer using the very same techniques I'm going to describe to you now. So wild animals that respond to it as well. 
I got a friend right now who's got a Mustang out in Nevada that entering a, a challenge and never been handled, six years old, never been handled, stallion, and she's trying to make this thing gentle. So these four principles are, um, the first one is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, a lot of people run their horses in races. That's a popular thing for girls to do and, and others as well. And so they always want to speed up. But the deal is you, when you speed up, just like everything in life, the, it gets more dangerous and more difficult. And so if you want to speed up, the first thing you do is slow it down and get it slow and smooth because smooth becomes fast. And the spiritual principle behind that is, is steadfastness. Steadfastness, you know, and it's how, that's God, how he describes himself. We, the scriptures say that his steadfast love yeah. endures forever. Amen. And so he's, he's steady. That's what a word means, is steady. God doesn't have highs. He doesn't have lows. He's steady. So what you want to do with your horse is slow it down. So slow hand movements. You don't jerk. You don't turn around fast. You, everything is slow and, and a slow pace, and they'll, they'll learn to get gentle. That also applies in our own life. You know, you, you've probably learned, if you haven't yet, I'm sure you're aware of it, that as you speed up, as things get faster, as things come at you faster and faster, the quality of your response degrades and the ability to respond quickly enough degrades as well. The second principle is give to pressure, okay? I can, I can do, and, and pressure isn't what you might think it is because just like you and I, uh, you're sitting there in some cutoffs or shorts or something in a T-shirt, you know when a fly lands on you. You can close your eye. You know exactly when a fly lands on you and where it is, and you could touch it with your finger. A horse is the same way. They can feel a fly on their back. So you don't need whips. You don't need spurs. You don't need uh, sticks. You don't need ropes. You don't need whips. You don't need any of that stuff. But you have to teach them to give to pressure, and pressure could be anything. Now, Prince isn't a horse, uh, but if he uh, would. That's a good name. Yeah, horse. yeah. Prince yeah. Horse, or Horse <laughs> Prince or whatever. Yeah, could be. Uh, so pressure is just simply doing this. I, I, I'm, I'm barely touching. He probably he can tell when I touch him and when I not. You probably can't see it, but I'm just barely lightly touching. He'll feel that. And so what you do with the horse is you, I would just lightly touch like this, and I count to myself one, two, three, four. Then I begin to press a little bit. One, two, three, four. Then I jiggle the one, two, three, four, and then I be press and push. And ultimately, my horse <coughs> will move his left foot. <laughs> and. And, and I will release. And I just taught my horse how to do that. I'll do that again. Okay. He's learning. If you do that five times in a row, I'll tell you, all I'll have to do is this. And then I won't even have to touch it. I, just, I can just look at it and he'll move his horse. So give to pressure. It's also keep your horse safe. Okay? Because what do they do when they, if they can't run, that's the first thing. God made them, they want to get out, the, get out of Dodge if something scares them. They'll pull back. And, and I'm telling you, they are way stronger than we are. Uh, and so you have to teach them to give to pressure. When they get tangled up, get the foot in something, you want them to learn to give, not pull against it. And that's, some, that's the application of our life. That, so I call that tenderheartedness. The biblical principle of giving to pressure is tenderhearted. So when, when trouble comes our way, yeah. God wants us to give in. And relax and not push against, not fight. We think, think you can think like a horse. Flee, get out of dodge, but don't push back. Okay? Give to pressure. Okay? The second, the third one is uh, is follow the feel. Okay, follow the feel. Uh, so I can take a horse and with my horses I can, you know, there's a halter on their face and a and a little rope out there. I have to, I can put the rope, just hang it over my finger like this and pick it up a little bit and the horse will back up. And or um, I can look at his hindquarters, and, and he'll turn his hindquarters away from you. But you teach them these things. So follow the field. If I lightly, when I want him to come someplace, if I pull, that horse is going to pull back, and, and he'll win every time. But if I just gently tug, I keep a light pressure on him, but I use my two fingers. So you know you can't be, I mean, you can squeeze kind of tight, but you don't have a lot of grip on him. You can teach them to follow the field. The biblical principle behind that is, um, is be able to hear God's voice and feel his presence. Mm -hmm. So that you know, and have you been a believer for a while, you come to learn these things, that you can indeed, even though God has never spoken audibly to me. I tell you what, I know when he's speaking to me. I can hear his voice. I know his voice. He says this, sheep will hear his voice, and they know it. When we are too, we will hear his voice, and we know it, and we can feel his presence when he's among us. Okay? 
The fourth one, and the last uh, principle, is just what I call a soft touch. Okay, whatever you do, do it softly, slow, methodical, and soft touch. And the biblical principle here is uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. So, uh, another way to say it would be slow to anger, quick to forgive. But those principles apply equally to your life. So right here at Arena Day today, we might be talking about uh, some of those things and get an opportunity to apply them not only to your horse, but you can learn how to apply them to your own life. That's and good. I can apply it to your life as well if you need help in that way. Amen. One more question. No. We're good. No, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. One more question. That's the last one. Vision. Oh, yes. That um, this church exists to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, um, the, 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 tendency, uh, the tendency in every church is to drift toward inward focus. And um, once that sets in, it's very difficult to move a church back to an, an outward uh, focus. So talk a little bit about the outward focus vision Thank you. for uh, for the arena ministry. And if I go long, you could just kick me or something like that so I know when to stop. There you go. Okay. I'll, I'll be my cue. Okay. Am I getting it already? Yeah. No? Okay. Quick I'll be fast. Uh, I was once a young man, and uh, I had a young bride. Of, we were in our first year of marriage, actually, when we ran into a couple that served with a ministry called The Navigators, and we learned some principles about both evangelism, which is leading people to Christ, and, and discipleship. And there were three principles that, that I've never forgotten. I still think about them, and, and they, they roll around my head and, and think about it today. Those principles, were not really principles, they're elements of dis- what it takes to do discipleship. The first one is an intentional leader. The second one is a relational environment, and the third one is a reproducible process. So you think about those three things, and in my case, I am intentional. I am interested. I love the Lord Jesus. I honor him. I bless him, and I want to make him known to others. And part of that, learn that's called the evangelism part, and then you help people grow in their faith in Christ, and they, that's called discipleship, that part of it. So for me, if you think about these intentional leaders, the intentional leader is just a person who wants to build into another person's life, and and it's like, you know, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, if you want to, got a problem, here, here's, a way, here's a place to find it. And, um, and the reproducible process here, I'm going to come back to the relational environment in a minute. Intentional leader, the reproducible process is, is me, my friend, or a small group of friends, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and those four things is all you need. That's the reproducible process, life on life, around God's word, together we're being taught. Uh, by the Spirit of, of God, who teaches us the truth of his word. So for me, you know, uh, the relational environment, when I retired, I thought a lot about this question. I, I worked and earned an income 52 years, and I've been retired for five of them the last five years. And I thought, what, what changes? What about these elements of discipleship change in retirement? And the thing that the Lord led me to was like, I realized actually for the uh, fresh. If not for, it wasn't for the first time because I've been familiar with the workplace ministry for years. But the idea of the relational environment, I, I realized how important and built in and, and uh, the relational Focus, vision, and you can be part of this ministry uh, by, uh, you, you can simply show up on an arena day this afternoon, one to four, sit in the stands, uh, cheer the riders, cheer the horses, meet people, meet people who maybe have a child or a neighbor or, or a friend who's, who are participating, get some bottles of water out of the church uh, fridge and take them out there and give them away, and if someone out there asks you 
why this church offers this uh, service uh, to people in the community, you know what to tell them. There are two overarching questions that are asked in the Bible. They are umbrella questions over a lot of other uh, questions. And this pair of questions sit kind of as a bookend uh, to frame what we call God's Word, the Holy Bible. And it consists of the first question from God in the Old Testament and the first question from a human being in the New Testament. And these two questions help us honor God. They help us gain a biblical perspective on life amidst all of its inconsistencies and its questions and all of the stressors that come into our life each and every day. And these are spiritual questions and they're relational questions. So one of the first questions recorded in the Bible uh, comes from God. And at the time, Adam and Eve were in hiding. They were afraid of, of God. They had broken a moral law that God had established. And uh, their, their behavior had caused them to pull away from God. And uh, it foreshadowed the consequence of their breaking that law and the consequence for them uh, was to be both physically and spiritually distanced from God. And so God comes seeking them in uh, the Garden of Eden. And this is in Genesis, the third chapter, verse 9, God's first question to human beings is, where are you? And the rest of the Hebrew part of the scripture uh, continues uh, to paint a, a really vivid picture of where humanity is after what we call the fall. And uh, we still live today in a fallen world, don't we? An imperfect uh, world. And without, uh, without God, uh, humans are lost. They're without hope, destined to futility, and we live in the valley of the shadow of death. But throughout this first part of the Bible, God provides a picture of hope, and God provides prophets who speak of the coming of a Messiah, a Christ, who will offer salvation to people. And so question no number one is from God. Where are you, man? Where are you, woman? It's a spiritual question and a relational question. So when the New Testament then uh, picks up the story, we don't have to wait very long for a resolution to the issue of our separation from God. The answer is fittingly formed in another question. And the first question in the New Testament comes from what we tend to bundle into the Christmas story. It's not really part of the Christmas story, but we tend to bundle these uh, t together. And it has to do with wise men from the East seeking Jesus, and they, they, who is known to them as the King of the Jews. And so they approach King Herod and this is recorded, second chapter of Matthew, second verse. Where is he? So the New Testament then goes to great lengths to show exactly where God is. God is in the midst of his people as the incarnate Son of God. And for this reason, Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then the New Testament ends with the promise of the presence of God, God's eternal presence in and among his, his people. So framed within these two questions, the narrative of Scripture is uh, continually hitting on the theme of proximity. The biblical text repeatedly asks the reader, asks us to consider, where are you? Where are we? And where is God? And these questions help orient God's people in confusing times. Have we ever lived in more confusing times? And we need both questions much in the same way that a map lays out a complex journey. In the summer of 2021, I took my three grandsons on a nine-day road trip. I'm just barely okay. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still not quite over that. <laughs> but on that trip, I taught them how to read a paper map. 
some of, I see some of you going and pulling out your, 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 your phones. So, so at any time on that trip, I could say it's map time, whose turn is it? And I would hear a groan from one of them. And I would say, without using a digital advice, just by looking at the map, where are we right now? It's a good question for Lost Pines Cowboy Church. Amen. Where are we right now? It is a season of transition for us. Where are we headed as a church right now? Winnie the Pooh said, you get where you're going by walking away from where you've been. When I first moved uh, from Texas to California in 1966, at uh, the age of 23 with Lubbock in a rearview mirror, I discovered a strange attraction. I discovered that I loved to go to a mall. I mean, it's just any mall. And, you know, a year into that, I, I'm, I, I finally came to me that a mall reminded me of the small towns that I had grown up in in Texas. Malls typically have signs around that say, you are here, which help you know where to get where you want to go. Maps and directional signs are helpful for finding physical direction. And the two big questions are practical ways to help us to ponder important spiritual directions for us as individuals and for us as a church. God always wants to know where are you. And often in challenging life situations and in a challenging church situation, we ask God, where are you? And the Bible regularly asks us to consider our personal proximity to God and his will, our proximity to our sisters and brothers in, our, in Christ, and our proximity to others. And meanwhile, people on all forms of media, cable news, social media platforms, influence us, train us, dupe us, and sometimes manipulate us into asking the question, what is the proximity of everyone else to me, to my position, to my way of thinking? Do you agree with me? If you don't support my position, I will cancel you. And many people in this country have come to value us versus them. And churches, without even thinking about it, can have an us versus them attitude. Churches will sometimes say, we will welcome you if you will fit into the way we like to do things. When a church should say, how can we shape our life to be welcoming to you? We want to be a fit for you. Christianity in this country is tragically divided. There's typically division in local churches. So a question may be, are we rallying, you know, around some cause in a manner that is void of love? Adding to all the noise that is out there, like a gong, like a rattling pan, like a clanging cymbal. And the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is against all the noise that's out there all the negative noise. Sometimes people tend to avoid asking themselves where they are in relation to God and others because it reminds them of their need for confession and repentance and perhaps the need to make amends to someone. It is far easier to ask where everybody else is and criticize their choices and their decision making and their intentions. But the act of looking inward and daily evaluating one's own heart is a practice that is essential 
for growing as a follower of Christ. So from time to time, I'll be asking all of us, including myself, the introspective question. Where are you in relation to God right now? And we always have God's permission to ask, God, where are you right now? I'm facing some decisions. I'm concerned about this health issue. I'm concerned about family who live at a distance. God, where are you relative to my concerns right now? God, I'm in a financial bind right now. Where are you? And all of these are prayer questions, aren't they? And we have God's permission to ask God that question at any time. Take it to God. Turn it over. And one of the greatest questions we can be asking is because of the love of Christ shown on the cross, what does love require of me? It's on my coffee mug. Hard to see that at times and hard to ask that. But as we look inward, each of us are reminded of our need for a Savior. And so we focus on the truth then that Jesus is present and approachable. He cares about the details of your life. He cares about your current struggles and the struggles of others in this world. But it is our task to intentionally draw near to him. Since Jesus has already come to us, we can experience his present daily by a wonderful old word we don't use very much. We can experience his presence by abiding in him. And God uses stressors and challenges like sickness and financial instability, rearranged schedules, global political chaos to draw people toward him for hope and for purpose. The enemy wants to use that, which causes us stress and fear and concern, as an argument to say that God doesn't care or that God isn't enough. God is present amid our difficulties, and God is worth seeking. So look for God spots all around you. Look for little miracles in your life. Look for places where God is showing up each day in your life and in the lives around you. I consider it a little miracle that I finally got a cell phone signal in the church office. Uh, Jared and Charlie uh, played a part in that miracle. Where is he? Pushes us to seek God in the midst of our concerns and our troubles. And it's a hope-filled question. Asking where is God takes us to daily prayer. It might take us to reading something from the book of Psalms or something from the book of Proverbs or then a passage from the New Testament because the Gospels are filled with accounts of Jesus responding to a question with a question that directs people to the issues that they should really be concerned about. And so a good question is, what are the really important questions that we all should be asking? One of my favorite questions is, I wonder what God is up to in all this. And by regularly letting God ask us, where are you? And our asking the human question, where is God in Christ? We can all orient our lives around the gospel. And we can make better sense of our circumstances. Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you. We adore you. We declare your greatness. We thank you for letting us see you in the person of Jesus. And we may question your nearness at times when we are troubled, when life is not falling to us pleasantly. But we pledge to return 
to trust by faith. And so we open ourselves to you. Ask us by your spirit. And through those who love us, where are we? And if we have drifted from nearness to you, pardon, forgive, and restore. Through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, what a, what a great message, Pastor Al. You know it's a great message when you hear the word, then you hear Winnie the Pooh reference, and then a reference to a Mac Davis song that makes the day complete. <laughs> well, this next song, this is our last song, uh, is uh, kind of takes off on the message. Uh, I, when Pastor Alton was uh, speaking, I leaned over to Janice and said, we picked the right song uh, for this. And so, the thing, and also it, for Randy's day today, the arena day, it has probably the most important word that a horse rider should know. I don't know. I don't ride horses. Uh, I'm scared of them. Not really, but I am a little bit. But uh, anyway, you'll figure out what word I'm talking about when we hit it here in just a minute. So if y'all would, one last time, please. Thank you. <laughs> when the stars came crashing down in tiny pieces to the ground, I was all alone down here, trapped beneath the atmosphere. Then I heard somebody call my name, and I spun around, caught a flame, gave in to a God I didn't know. Now everything is falling into place. Brand new life is calling, and I owe it all to grace. So much pride of living in your world Savor what you did for me You gave me something I want everyone to see When we stumble and it all goes wrong Only you can make it right So I say, oh I'm learning to be the light Whoa, whoa Learning to be the light. Whoa, whoa. When a heart is cold as ice, you can't melt it with advice. No one wants to listen to a list of things they shouldn't do. So I build a city on a hill and I light a candle on the seal knowing you'll always be knocking at the door god i just want to love on everyone all i have is yours to give so let the people come right living in your world say what you did for me you gave me something I want everyone to see. And when we stumble and it all goes wrong, only you can make it right. So I say, oh, I'm learning to be the light. Whoa, whoa, I'm learning to be the light. Whoa. I've learned it to be the light that makes the shadows hide, the light that breaks a curse of pride, the light that takes the weary in its arms. When it all came crashing down, there was only darkness all around, but in the distance I could see a flame. So much brighter living in your world. Say what you did for me. 
You gave me something I want everyone, I mean everyone to see. When we stumble and it all goes wrong, only you can make it right. So I say, oh, I'm learning to be the light. Oh, oh, I'm learning to be the light. Oh, oh, I'm learning to be the light. I'm learning to be the light. Oh, oh, I'm learning to be the light. Go out and be a light for someone this week. Thank you all so much for joining us today. God bless.